The victim was laying in the field. She was naked. It appeared that she had a gunshot wound to her head. It had this surreal feeling that this was going to be a tremendous case. Identifying the female was tough. There was no ID, no clothes. You start thinking, what if something terrible has happened? But she was working. Where were you? He really didn't have an answer for that. She didn't have any enemies. We just didn't understand it. It was a chess match between a murder and two detectives that only had a few pieces on the chessboard. Now we were back to ground zero. We were alerted to some news that changed the whole case. We're going to bring justice. Let's go get him. It was a very cold, bitter cold February day when I got a call. The dispatcher had a sense of urgency in her voice that was uh, very serious. So I ran lights and sirens to the entrance of the Metro Park where I was the first one on the scene. There was a light covering of snow, but about 15 feet off the roadway, and you could see very clearly that it was a unclad female. I remember pulling in and just seeing the cruisers there, and it had this surreal feeling that this was going to be a tremendous case. The young woman was lying on the right side. It appears that she has two gunshot wounds, one on the left side of the face, one on the back of the head. Once they had found the gunshot wounds, we knew that it was definitely a homicide. Since the body was naked, we thought that probably a sexual assault occurred. The coroner's office conducted a rape kit. That rape kit was sent off to Columbus's lab. Identifying the female was kind of tough. We didn't have anything to go off of other than a tattoo that was on her torso and a necklace that she was wearing. We knew that that information would be vital in getting her identified. She had dark hair, brunette. She was young, very young. I would estimate it in her late teens, early 20s. It hits home when you see somebody who's young like that being discarded that way in such a violent, undignified manner. Honestly, I was thinking that's somebody's baby, that's somebody's child. I remember it plain as day. Several officers have children the same age, so the investigation became a little bit more personal. We wanted to figure out who did this. At the scene, it's a beehive of activity. We began searching the entire park to see if there was any evidence that the suspect left behind. But there was no physical evidence left at the scene. There's no bullet casings, no murder weapon, no cell phone. Neighbors didn't hear anything. We were kind of stuck with absolutely zero leads. And so we wanted to get that out to the press in hopes that somebody would come forward with a name for us. A young woman was found with a gunshot wound and no clothes on right here in Metro Park in Grove City. It's not clear if there are any suspects or how exactly she ended up in this Grove City Park. This doesn't happen in Grove City, so this community has a concern. We knew that tips are going to start coming in, so we had to set up some type of phone call bank. Columbus Police, Tech 62. As we were at the scene for several hours and, and getting frustrated that there was no tips or clues, we received information from the Columbus Police Department that some friends and co-workers at the Bodega Bar were in the process of reporting their friend missing, who was the same age as our victim. So we had a uh, employee leave work last night she has not been home. Uh, her phone is off. Nobody can find her. We can't find her car around work. OK, how old is she? She's 21. How do you spell her name? That's Reagan, R-E-A-G-A-N, Pokes. Reagan and I talked every day 
virtually every single day. So it was very odd to me that I couldn't get a hold of her. Reagan is 21 years old. She's a psychology major at Ohio State University, just getting ready to graduate. She had said from a very early age that that's where she had her heart set on and that was the only school she was going to apply to. And it was a little bit of a challenge for us because as a family, we moved to Florida the start of her freshman year and she was gonna be out on her own. But she was really proud of the fact that she did have a job and she was able to balance that with being in school. I had called her that Wednesday evening of February 8th. She was working. She said, Dad, I can't talk right now, but I will call you when I'm done. And um, that call never came. She is a college student. I'm like, she could have been tired. She might have forgot. It's happened before. But the next morning, when we still couldn't get a hold of her, that's when you really started to feel in your gut that something was wrong. The roommates didn't know where she was at. We called the university and found out that she didn't show up for class that morning, which was highly unusual. That's when I started calling the Columbus police and hospitals. I called the restaurant and asked the manager to call and report her as missing because they were the last people to see her the night before. Does she have any, like, tattoos or anything like that? She has one under her left arm. We had a physical description that was very similar to the description of the victim that was laying in the field. We wanted to go down to the Bodega Bar and start interviewing people. Once we got to the bar, we had photographs of the necklace and the tattoo to be able to show her friends who would know what type of jewelry she had. And they told us that Reagan Tokes had the same tattoo and would have wear the same type of necklace. But until a family member positively identified her, we didn't know 100% if it was Reagan Tokes. That evening, the phone rang and it was the Grove City Police Department. Where's Grove City? I didn't even realize at the time that Grove City was a suburb of Columbus. I said, I've been waiting for the Columbus police to call me. Why are you calling me? And the gentleman said that they had a body that had been discovered in the park, and they were fairly certain that it was Reagan. And I can remember hearing that and just saying to him, you have to be mistaken. That, that can't possibly be true. No one would have wanted to hurt her. That has to be wrong. Obviously, you're not prepared for any of that. It just felt not real. We can't quickly get to the morgue in Ohio because we're in Florida, but my brother lives in the Ohio area, and he said, I will go in the morning. And I remember just being up all night praying just hoping that there was a mistake. And by the time the next day came, there was going to be different information. We took a photograph of her face. We presented that to a relative, and a positive identification was made. My brother called me from the morgue the next morning and confirmed that indeed it was her. You're in disbelief. We went in shock. We, we didn't want to believe it. Didn't sleep for days. Hardest thing imaginable as a parent. You know, instead of getting ready to celebrate her graduation from the only school she ever wanted to go to, we're thrust into the middle of having to plan a funeral. I look back on it sometimes, and I still hope I'm going to wake up from a nightmare. Reagan didn't have any enemies. Reagan didn't have any bad habits, things that could have got her into a potentially dangerous situation. We just didn't understand it. At this point in time, this investigation really kicked into high gear. We wanted to know who Reagan Tokes hung out with, where her car may be, who calls her, what type of classes she goes to and anyone who may want to harm her. We learned pretty quickly that she left Bodega Bar around 9.45, 9.50, and that she walked out of the bar towards her vehicle. And occasionally, somebody would walk them to the cars if they felt unsafe. 
But that night, when Reagan left, she didn't ask anyone to walk her to her car. Our concern with that was, did somebody follow her out of the bar? Did the ex-boyfriend have something to do with this? We were kind of in a fight, so we were breaking up. The suspect confirmed to us that he was in the area at the same time that Reagan was. And it was a turning point in our investigation. There wasn't a bigger opportunity than this to put a truly bad person in jail. On February 9th, 2017, we got a phone call from a citizen saying that a female body has been found in the middle of a field in the Santa Grove Metro Park. We confirmed that it was Reagan Tokes that was laying in the field. I knew I could count on a phone call every single day. Hey, Dad, how you doing? And I'll never get that phone call from Reagan again. Who could possibly do this? It's the last thing I think of when I try to go to bed. It's the first thing I think of when I wake up. Reagan was always reliable. Reagan wasn't the type to go out messing around, being out on a Wednesday night. She was working, she was going home. Matter of fact, she told me her and her roommates had plans to just watch a movie and order a pizza. What would she have been doing in a park? No one would have wanted to hurt her. We started watching the video surveillance from the night that Reagan left. We were anticipating someone getting up and following her, and we watched for several minutes after she leaves. And nobody leaves the bar. We asked all the coworkers if there's anybody at the bar who was harassing her or trying to form a relationship with her that she was scared of. And nobody could provide us with a name of anyone that was harassing her but they did point us to the direction of an ex-boyfriend that she was on again, off again, may have just broken up with a few days prior. Reagan had a boyfriend named Jake. It was a up and down relationship and they did break up and she and I had talked about that and it really wasn't something that was a long-term permanent fit for her. In my police experience, most violent crimes in this nature are committed by someone who is close to the victim a current boyfriend or ex-boyfriend or an ex-husband. So we had to immediately send detectives over to interview the ex-boyfriend and see what information that he knew about Reagan. We thought he could be a potential suspect. When was the last time you talked to her? Um, it was, well, like actual talk, like... Talk, text. Um, well, text was 9-11. Nine, nine um, it was the night. Okay, and that was your last time you talked to her? Um, last text? time I talked to her was probably a week and a half ago. Is that normal? Um, well, not usually. I, I, I talk to her every day, but we were kind of in a, a, a like a fight, so we were breaking up, kind of. You guys break up a lot? It was the second time, yeah. What was the breakup over? Uh, it was just we didn't have enough time really for each other. We had to focus on school. So there was no cheating going on? Oh, no. When did you hear about? Um. Right before I was about to go take my test yesterday, um, our good friend Kirsten called me and... What'd she say? She just said, you need to call her. She texted me. She said, call me. It's an emergency. I did right away. Oh, you have a test yesterday? Mm-hmm. No, it's a show. One of the things that our detectives are trained to do is they want to read his body language, his tone of his voice, his nervousness. His body language and his demeanor was strange. He certainly wasn't showing the emotions that you would think that somebody would show at that point in time. Was she involved in drugs that you know of? Not that I know. Did she mention a text or anything about anybody being odd at work or feeling uncomfortable about people, customers coming in? It was, no, she didn't. Do you guys post anything on social media or anything? Or um, yeah, I posted her? a couple things. Might have got some likes. I can show you if you want. Yeah, let me see your phone, please. We want to see if he's trying to downplay his emotions because he doesn't want us to think that he's responsible in any way, shape, or form. Let me ask you this. I'll take this the wrong way. Okay. 
Why in the world would you write I, that you're in a better place? Uh, I was talking to her like she, like, I don't know, like she's in heaven. I believe that there's, she's somewhere now. She's well, somewhere. You just don't hear it very often, better place when somebody was living a good life. I just, I don't know. Why would her death mean that she was in a better place? Isn't this a little odd? He really didn't have an answer for that, and it kind of really piqued our curiosity at that point in time. When she was working at the bar, where were you during that time? When she was working, we were here. You say we, who do you mean? Uh, me and my roommates. So, what did you guys do here? Um, oh, we watched some uh, an old movie. Josh is out there, I think. You could ask him what it was. I, don't, I fell asleep through it. When we get a, an investigation like this, the first 48 hours are the most critical. We've ruled out Jake. We had no suspect, so now we were back to ground zero. There's something there that's going to lead us to a suspect that did this to Reagan. We found major pieces of evidence, and it became very clear that we were familiar with who the suspect was. We only had one shot at him. Reagan Toast was a 21-year-old Ohio State student who was found murdered in Saturday Grove Metro Park. We didn't have a suspect. There was this sense of frustration, but also all those emotions start to build and you just really don't want to stop. We are going to solve this and we're going to bring justice. The Bodega Bar is located in what they call the short north area of Columbus, Ohio. It's a lot of trendy type of restaurants and bars, but along with that, a nefarious crowd will come down to take advantage of other individuals visiting that area. So we really start to believe that this could have been a total stranger on stranger abduction. We knew that it was probably gonna be more difficult to solve. Reagan would park behind the bar which was not a very well-lit street, and her car was missing. Because the car was not at the crime scene or anywhere close to it, we knew that most likely the suspect had her car. take Columbus proper and all the suburbs, there's over a million and a half people that live in Columbus. Finding Reagan's car was going to be a tremendous undertaking because we just had no information. This car could be anywhere in Franklin County. It could be anywhere in, in the United States. We knew that it was probably going to be difficult. We had to find the vehicle fast. It had snowed the night before, and salt trucks are constantly up and down side roads, and deterioration of evidence was going to occur. We want that car bad. We are using every resource that we have to try to locate where this car is at. One of the things we were hoping for and counting on was results back from one of the many license plate readers that are around Central Ohio. License plate readers are cameras that are placed on a lot of emergency vehicles, and as they go by other vehicles, it reads the license plate of that vehicle. It goes into a national database, and if it reads that tag, it will show an alert that, hey, there's a stolen car there. We were able to search for Reagan's tag through this national database. And we had a hit on where Reagan's car was. It was a break in the case. A commercial vehicle did read her license plate on Forest Road in Columbus, Ohio. But there was a several hour delay in it hitting with the database and telling us where it last saw it at. So we immediately sent police to that area to see if they could physically lay eyes on that vehicle and locate it. We didn't know at that time if it was going to still be there. We went out and found the vehicle parked. Reagan's car was in a neighborhood in Columbus with a lot of abandoned buildings, boarded up and shut. It was a rough neighborhood. So they began searching the area to see if there was anything suspicious in close to or around any of the houses. We're still looking for her phone. We're still looking for her purse. We're still looking for her clothing, everything. 
They dusted the outside of the car for fingerprints. They dusted the inside of the car for fingerprints. They swabbed the steering wheels and the consoles and the gear shifters. Anything where a suspect would have or could have touched. I just had a gut feeling that we were going to get some evidence off that vehicle. And sure enough, there was actually major pieces of evidence there. We found cigarette butts that were inside the vehicle. I remember calling uh, Detective Forney and asked him, I said, hey, did, did Reagan smoke? And he said, no, absolutely not. We knew that whoever was in that car, that DNA was going to be on that cigarette butt. They collected the cigarette butts, and they rushed them off to the lab for DNA comparison. It was very exciting for us at that point, knowing that there's something there that's going to lead us to a suspect that did this to Reagan. But we know that DNA results sometimes take weeks, if not months, to get. Everybody was exhausted. We had been going for about 48 hours straight. So I said, why don't we go home, get a couple hours sleep? I just remember I got home, I took a shower, and the next thing I know, my phone's ringing. We were alerted to some news that changed the whole case. Reagan Toast was found murdered in the side of Metro Park. There's days where you just wonder how this happened to your little girl. How could this evil path ever cross with such an innocent person? We knew that we were at a point where there was nothing further for us to follow up with. The police were able to find her car. We were praying DNA evidence would lead to the person who did this to her. So the DNA became the most important evidence that we had at that time. DNA matches from laboratories take months, weeks, days. We're just at home sitting on pins and needles awaiting information. We were pretty exhausted physically and mentally. We needed to decompress. We go home, a couple of hours pass, and my phone rings. It's my sergeant. He said, you're not going to believe this. We got a DNA hit, and it was a turning point in our investigation. It was a definite adrenaline boost. We had been going for two days straight, but nobody was tired anymore. In most of our eyes, there wasn't a bigger opportunity than this to do good and put a truly, truly bad person in jail. The DNA match for the cigarette came back to Brian Goldsby. It became very clear that we were familiar with who this suspect was. Goolsby had a lengthy criminal history. He was arrested and sentenced for robbery and rape. And just recently, after serving a six-year sentence, was released from the Department of Corrections. I filed a receiving stolen property warrant for Goolsby's arrest for being in possession of Reagan's car. And we knew that was how we could get our hands on him and get him into an interview room to see if we could put the gun in his hand. We knew that Goolsby was the registered sex offender. We were quickly able to find an address of where he registered at. He was living in a halfway house, the transitional home from prison to the real world. I made an immediate call to my SWAT team. I said, I need everybody to come in. We're going to go get Brian Goldsby. We went out with several other members and other cars, and we started doing surveillance at the residence. The belief was that he was inside the house. I made the call, and I said, let's breach the door. Let's go in and see if we can find him. This was a very large house with multiple bedrooms, multiple adult male sex offenders who have been in prison. The SWAT team secured all the people in the house, and they started sending people out of the house one at a time. Our hands were on him. He was handcuffed and finally had him in custody. As the SWAT team is effecting the arrest, I start preparing for the interview. I need as much information that I can possibly get on Goldsby before I sit down with him, especially because he was in prison and he knows the system. We knew going into it that there was a high probability he wasn't going to want to talk to us. We only had one shot to try to get him to voluntarily interview with us. If he mentioned that he wanted an attorney at any point in time, it was done. 
on the more intense interviews. I do prefer to have someone else in the room with me. I chose Detective Deskins because we do have a great working relationship. And we're able to play off of each other. I want to talk to you about Wednesday night. We didn't have him for the homicide yet. All we had him for was we knew he had stolen Reagan's car. We didn't have enough to file our arrest warrant for murder at that point, but Brian Goldsby had a history of rape and robbery, so we felt pretty confident. There was more to his story. We wanted a complete confession for the murder. We wanted Brian Goldsby to say, I did it. Remember Wednesday night, you were snowing out? Yes. OK. So where were you Wednesday? We can't smoke in here, man. Hey, we have to get all kinds of permissions before we do this. Right. Because to smoke cigarettes? Yes. We don't typically allow people to smoke, but in a high profile case like this, we can use that to our advantage. The way that that works, you give me a little bit, we'll verify that you're telling the truth, we'll give you a little bit, give and take relationship. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. So let's start with Wednesday. Tell me the truth. Where were you Wednesday? Went downtown. What area downtown? Fifth, third, fourth, fifth. What were you doing down there? Just walking around. Yeah, just hanging out. When he told me he was around third, fourth, or fifth Avenue, I was like, hell yes, because he just confirmed to us that he was in the area at the same time that Reagan was. So, what else do you do while you're down there? We know what happened. We know why it happened. Tell me what happened. Mm -hmm. I want you to copy that. Say this, and I'll start talking. Okay. Let me get the permission. All right. One of the strategies that we use is we want to be their friend, we want to be their buddy, so we tell them that our bosses won't allow us to do certain things. So if he wouldn't have told us that he was in the area, we would have said that our boss doesn't allow him to go smoke. But Lieutenant Davison granted us permission to do that because he was cooperating with us. Come on, man. Got you one. I knew this was a kind of a dance we were going through. It was going to be a long interview. You keep somebody in a tiny little room, they kind of shut down more, and they don't want to talk to you. It was cold out, so I actually offered him a jump seat just to make him comfortable and make him believe he could trust me. We knew that this would be a great time to build rapport with him. We just had to break down those barriers so that he would open up to us and tell us the truth. How was your son? Our whole thing was we wanted to treat him right because we wanted him to tell us what he did to Reagan Tokes. Wednesday night, we went downtown. What happened? Yeah, I know. You tell me, and then I'll show you what we have. He immediately started asking about the file that I had on the desk. He knows that he's there for receiving stolen property, but he didn't know anything more than that. And I could tell that he was really curious to see what we had. What happened? You were in the car. Mm -hmm. What? There's a girl walking down the street. Mm -hmm. Is somebody hurt or something? Mm -hmm. Tell me about the girl. Tell me about why you got in the car like that. If you lay out, I'll, I'll explain everything. Brian Goldsby was our suspect for the murder of Reagan Tokes. We had his DNA in Reagan's car. He had a lengthy criminal history. And he told us he was in the area of where Reagan was at. Tell me about the girl. Tell me about why you got in the car with her. If you leave, I'll, I'll explain everything. He was playing a game with us. I think in his mind, he was like, if I deny long enough, they'll give me a little bit, and I'll know what they have. It was a chess match between a murder and two detectives that only had a few pieces on the chessboard. I'll show you this. I lost this. So we have the receipts, all right? Inside Reagan's car, we had found three Chase ATM receipts. One of those showed that $60 had been withdrawn from Reagan's account the night that she went missing. We were able to obtain video surveillance from Chase Bank on their ATM machines. I wanted to show him a little bit of the evidence that we have so that he knew that it's very important that he is honest with us because we weren't joking around. 
Is she might you in the car? No. Dad in the car. Did you drive or she drive? Once he admitted to us that he was in the car with Reagan, I knew we needed to keep after him to tell us the truth. How'd you get her car? Did you? I just actually opened the door. She opened the door. What was her reaction when he got in the car with her? Was she scared, nervous, upset? She was cool. Police cars passed us and everything. Did you treat her right? Yeah. All I wanted, all I wanted was money, man. Did she have any cash on? No. He told her to drive to chase. The Chase Bank video showed in the passenger seat, you could tell that there was a shadowy figure there. You control her with a gun. Anybody in their right mind is going to get out of that car if you don't have a gun on them. We had him with Reagan, we had him in Reagan's car, we had a robbery that had occurred. Now we needed to move into the murder. You need to tell me where you go next. I need to know about the Hunter Park. To the car left. You went to the side of the park. Took her for a car and left. Did you drop her off there? Yeah, I dropped her off there and left. Did you ever take her clothes off? No. Right. No. She takes them off then herself? I didn't have her do it. I didn't have her take her clothes off. Did no. she have sex with her own? No. You sure? Probably. Nothing. We knew that Goldsby was previously arrested for robbery and rape. Since Reagan was found naked, we believe that she was probably sexually assaulted by Goldsby. We were waiting to get rape kit results back. We didn't know what we were going to get, but it was a strategy to make him think that we knew that he raped Reagan. She found blood, naked, right there. I, what other explanation could I don't mean? know about any other explanation or nothing. I didn't shoot nobody at work. I don't until that, my family. You and I walk around. Listen, you seem like a decent guy. That's why we're having such a hard time understanding. Did I don't have the heart to kill nobody. Did you That's why it was put it up to her head? Or was it an accident? We started to give him an out on he's not a bad person if it was by accident. It allows him to place the blame on someone or something else. That's the part of this, this puzzle right here with all of this. Why you shot her? I left. As soon as I made her get out of the car, I made her stop right there. I told her, don't move for 30 minutes. I got in the car, I turned around, and I left. If it was a, a road where people were in and out, OK. But I'm not buying that part of it. But I got two little girls out there, man. I ain't killed nobody, man. All I wanted is money. I've never shot nobody in my whole entire life, man. All right, man. So it's going to be that's up to interpretation. We sort of hit a wall during the interview where he would not change his story. So Rick left for a little bit, playing the role of being frustrated with him. And I came in and kind of used the, hey, man, I'm on your side about this. I understand this isn't your fault. I know it was an accident. I didn't, I didn't kill nobody. Well, even if you didn't pull the trigger, you shot her. Mm -hmm. You shot her. You didn't pull the trigger. Whoever took her life, you see what I'm saying? You feel bad for who took her life, or you feel bad no, for I'm her? No, I'm talking about I feel bad for him because it's, it's going to be bad for them. I feel I feel extreme remorse for her because that's when, and anything that happened, I thought that was not in the intentions. As far as me killing someone, I didn't right. kill nobody, man. We got to a point where it was just a stalemate. He was not willing at that point to tell us what happened. So we formulated a strategy for Detective Deskins to make up another individual that forced him to commit these crimes so that he could deflect the blame on to someone else. You didn't want to hurt nobody. You're not lying on like that. I actually believe that. One way you could have controlled her was with a second guy. If there was a second dude in the car, now it's behind him. I saw something change in Brian's eyes. He saw an out. Help yourself out. Be the stand-up man for that girl's family, goddammit.
I know you didn't pull the trigger, but I know somebody else was doing the car. For several hours, Brian Goldsby denied having anything to do with Reagan's murder. So we got to that point where I threw in that extra person. I mean, I don't know anything like Brian. Who is he? He told me he needed about $2,000, $3,000 tonight or he's going to be my family. Okay. He actually started to take the bait. You could see the, the wheels turning in his head, trying to come up with a story. He was the victim now. Well, your kids ain't gonna die. We can look out for them. You talk about your family? That poor girl's got a family too. No, man. What's his name? What's his street name? TJ. TJ? So his name's TJ. Wow, this strategy is just brilliant. I, I knew, there was just a part of me that knew that Nick was going to get him to confess. You got the tattoo right here. Who was driving at the park? I'm in a passenger seat. He's in the back seat. We went behind her. We get down to the park. He says, take off all your clothes, get out. He says, walk until I tell you to stop. She walks, she's naked, he gets behind her, then he goes, pow! She falls. She's laying on the ground. I'm looking on the car, and he bends down and shoots her hand. I called it a lie fashion because he was making up this TJ story, but he also was trying to make it as close to what really happened as possible without lying to keep his story straight. By blaming all of this on TJ, it was a way for him to explain it away without confessing himself. I mean, we know that everything that he described, we know he was describing himself. He just substituted TJ's name for his own. You're gonna help me find TJ. I'm not gonna do that. By what you've already done. Take five. I gotta go talk to my boss, man, and then we'll call, I'll come back and see you. Brian Goldsby introduced TJ, this imaginary third person, after we proposed the idea of somebody else into this scenario. We're going to prove that TJ never existed. Sit it out. Come on, Brian. You want to sit down? Chill for a minute? I'll sit with you. Did you and TJ have any sexual relations with the girls? You told me to do it, bro. All right, you had sex with her? Did she fight you at all when you were having sex with her? She told me all she wanted to do was go home. I told her everything was going to be cool. We spent quite a bit of time disproving a lot of his TJ story. We started looking through all of the arrest records. We looked through leads to see if anybody had tattoos that would match this TJ. We interviewed Brian Goldsby's friends. We wanted to make sure that there was no stone left unturned. Having Goldsby on tape saying that he raped her and saying that he was with this fictional character, TJ, when TJ shot her. That was good enough for the prosecuting attorney. The interview was an integral part of our case. It's always a benefit to have a statement or a confession from a suspect. Uh, even if a statement is a denial, at least it locks him into a particular story so that he can't change it later on. We had him admitting key factors, uh, the kidnapping, the aggravated robberies at the ATM. We had DNA from the rape kit that we obtained later that showed he did have sexual uh, conduct with her. He later told the officers that he dumped the gun in a sewer, and we actually found the murder weapon where he said it would be. We were scrambling 
to get everything pulled together and get to the airport to go back to Ohio. And they called and said, we have somebody in custody. There is somebody responsible who is going to be held accountable. Being in the courtroom with them was very, very difficult emotionally. He seemed completely void of emotion. It was like looking through a soulless individual. Brian Goldsby was found guilty of aggravated murder, of aggravated robbery, kidnapping, and the rape of uh, Reagan Tokes. Goldsby was given life without parole, and Goldsby will die in prison. The verdict came in on Reagan's birthday, March 13th. I definitely think that there is some significance to that. She and I definitely had a belief in signs. It was very ironic that on that day, well, we would have been celebrating a birthday with her. That was the last day of what I perceived to be that guy's life. You know, his life was over that day. I think Reagan had a hand in that. Since this tragedy happened to Reagan, rather than let grief consume us, we decided to work to change a system that does not hold violent offenders accountable appropriately for their actions. This didn't have to happen. This was not a new criminal. This was a guy that had 52 infractions while incarcerated in prison and was allowed to walk out scot-free. How did this guy get to do this? So the reagan Tokes Act addresses appropriate sentencing for violent offenders. If somebody does not reform while incarcerated, they could actually have time added to their sentence. It addresses GPS monitoring in real time, and it also addresses the caseload for parole officers. We can lessen the opportunity for another family to have to go through what we did. We are forever grateful and indebted to these incredible police officers. They do their absolute best above and beyond the call of duty day in and day out for families like ours. To honor her legacy and her light, we created the Reagan Delaney Tokes Memorial Foundation. We provide self-defense classes and we have been able to award $120,000 in scholarships. She was grateful and appreciative of the education that she was able to receive. So what better way to honor her memory and legacy? I think Reagan's legacy will, will change a lot of lives, and I think she's watching us every move we make. I hope we make her proud. I think we are. For more about criminal confessions, go to Oxygen.com.